morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah, and I am the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to provide everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state. We again begin today's briefing on a sad note. Maine CDC is now aware of two additional individuals who have passed away with COVID-19. One was a woman in her 80s from Waldo County, and the other was a man also in his 80s from Cumberland County. The passing of these two individuals marks the 13th and 14th deaths, respectively, in the state of Maine. On a day when nearly 13,000 other families across the state, across the country, are grieving the loss of their loved ones, we all add and offer our condolences to the families of these two individuals at their passing. This is a good reminder that every single case that we talk about, every single hospitalization, and sadly, every single death is a person, a person who was somebody's spouse, son, daughter, mother, father, friend, and community member. And we all mourn their passing. As of this morning, Maine CDC is reporting 537 total cases of COVID-19 an increase of 19 cases since yesterday. There have also been 101 individuals who have been hospitalized. Overall, there have been 187 individuals who have recovered, an increase of 11 since yesterday. Sadly, as I noted, there have now been a total of 14 individuals who have passed away. Maine CDC staff have been working almost around the clock and have thus far fielded 4,468 consultations since our activation began. With respect to our lab testing, our lab continues to process samples seven days a week. And our most recent turnaround time calculation shows that we are able to return specimens within 24 hours of receipt, thereby allowing physicians, healthcare workers, and others in the healthcare system to make quick, clear decisions on how to care for patients and how to best take care of those in their lives. We are also continuing the process of pushing out personal protective equipment to healthcare facilities and other healthcare institutions across the state. That work is ongoing on a rolling basis. As we receive orders, we are able to pull, pack, and ship them on a rolling basis again to make sure that healthcare providers who are on the front lines have the protection they need in order to keep taking care of COVID-19 patients. In terms of the vital assets that we track, at present, Maine CDC is aware of 305 intensive care unit beds, 154 of which are available. We are also aware of over 330 ventilators, 282 of which are available. And we are also tracking 233 of the so-called alternative ventilators. I'd like to close today by thanking a group of individuals that don't get recognized nearly enough for the sacrifices that they've made. And that group is each and every one of you who's watching today. Everyone in Maine has had some part, if not the whole part of their lives completely upended by the coronavirus situation. What's been remarkable is not simply how much has changed, but how quickly it has all changed. Changes to our lives that were 
utterly inconceivable a month ago are now commonplace and have been accepted by people all across Maine. And I think that's because all Maine people understand that what we are trying to accomplish via these physical distancing recommendations is nothing short of saving lives. But that doesn't mean it's not disruptive. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge those disruptions and thank everyone for abiding them. We fully recognize that book club and bingo nights have been replaced by virtual board games and big cats. Ever since Governor Mills issued her executive order to stay safe, people across the state have been all in, in every sense of the phrase. And I'd like to thank every single person in Maine for helping all of us flatten the curve and keep the rest of us safe. But I acknowledge that doing so has entailed personal sacrifice. No one thanks you for canceling your child's birthday party. No one thanks you for postponing your wedding. No one thanks you for not going to prom. And no one thanks you for fundamentally changing the way you observe and celebrate important religious holidays. But I'd like to change that today. I'd like to thank each and every person in Maine for the personal sacrifices that they've made. We've asked you to stay inside and you've done so. Three months ago, who would have ever thought by canceling a birthday party or a pub crawl or a prom, you could actually help save lives. But that is precisely what your actions or inactions have done. And so on behalf of everyone else in Maine, thank you for doing your part to keep the rest of us safe. I'd like to pause now and take some questions from our colleagues in the media who are joining by phone. And we will start with Joe Lawler from the Press Herald. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. Can you hear me? Sure enough, Joe. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering what you thought of uh, efforts in Massachusetts, uh, the um, uh, partners in health, where they're really ramping up the um, contact tracing, you know, having hundreds of people doing a, a phone bank. Is that a, a good strategy? And is it something that Maine should consider? And I, I just have also a quick follow-up on the um, on the. Uh, remote hospitals that you announced yesterday like how would you be staffing those and um are you concerned about taking away staff from regular hospitals to staff those great uh so joe's first question is about an initiative that's getting off the ground in massachusetts about expanding the number of people who can work with our gumshoe epidemiologists to go out and ask people where they've been and who they've been in contact with it's an interesting idea, Joe, and it's one that I'm, I'm familiar with, and it's one that we've thought about and looked at here. One of the reasons Massachusetts has gone in that direction is because of the significantly higher number of cases that they have experienced there relative to their neighboring states, including Maine. It's an intriguing idea, and with proper training, a lot of different healthcare workers could certainly serve as assistance to some of our epidemiologists. So I'm aware of that. Uh, I've spoken with one of my colleagues in Massachusetts about it, and I'm quite intrigued. It's, I, I can't speculate about whether we might need such a force here in Maine, but if we do, it's good to know that we've got a model in one of our neighboring states. Uh, with respect to the alternative care sites and the staffing, uh, Joe, what I want to emphasize is that staffing these and those decisions are being made in very close collaboration and partnership with our colleagues at the healthcare systems. Uh, and so we are working with them to determine the best staffing model. As you note, Joe, we don't want to add by subtracting. 
adding to the ACSs by subtracting from the hospitals is not something that we necessarily want as our goal. The goal in these situations is to find the right mix of staff so that staff that can be at the ACS working with the healthcare systems can take care of the right acuity of patients and other staff can still be at the hospital potentially taking care of higher acuity patients. No final decisions have been made there. We want to be ready when that situation occurs and if the need occurs in the same way that the snow plows are gassing up right now, but no final decision has been made. And I want to stress that any decisions of that sort will be made in partnership with our colleagues in the healthcare system. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, I'm wondering two things. One, is there any thought still that there might be a seasonal variance in this, a reduction in the number of places as we approach the warmer months, given that places like New Orleans have massive outbreaks during warmer weather? And also, is there any way that we're going to be able to get back to normal and get back to work before there's a either a vaccine or a treatment approved. Great. Uh, so Amy raises two great questions on the scientific front. One is whether there might be some degree of seasonal variance to the way that coronavirus is transmitted as the weather gets warmer. And, and Amy, I, I have to say it's, it's, a, it's a tantalizing idea. The idea that as we get into warmer months, maybe something about the virus or maybe something about people changes such that transmission goes down. As you note, however, there has been ongoing transmission in pretty warm parts of the world. The Middle East, the southern parts of the United States, different countries in Southeast Asia. What I'll say, Amy, is that it's a, it's a good scientific question. And as with a lot of scientific questions, until all the data are in, we won't know for sure. Based on the last time that I've heard Dr. Anthony Fauci speak about this, his view at that time, which was about a week ago, and so much can change, but his view at that time was that even if there were to be some degree of seasonal variation, it probably wouldn't be on the scale of what we see with influenza, where influenza really drops off, not to zero, but quite significantly. But again, so much is changing. Scientists are learning more and more about the spread. And really, as, we, we, as we've seen in other warmer parts of the country, like New Orleans and southern Florida, transmission can still occur. Uh, your second question is something that's been on the minds of a lot of folks, which is what does returning to normal look like and when might that happen? Now, speculating as to when is difficult because so much is changing. But what I can say, Amy, is that in the same way that we climbed the stairs up toward where we are now with the various restrictions that are in place, putting them in in layer upon layer as the situation changed, we will probably similarly and in reverse order climb back down the stairs in the same way. So there probably will not be a big switch that is flipped and one day everything will go back to normal. That process in the same way we got here in a stepwise fashion will probably, we will probably be re-emerging in a stepwise fashion as well. When that happens is difficult to speculate. But what I can tell you is that the team here at Maine CDC with the team at the US CDC is taking a look at the data on an almost hourly basis to look for signs of when we might be able to move in that direction. We haven't seen them yet, but when we do, of course, we'll be ready to share. Um, I'd like to turn next to Don Kerrigan at News Center. Good morning, Dr. Shaw. Uh, two questions related about, about hospitals. Uh, there was a newspaper story this morning suggesting that CDC doesn't know day to day how many COVID-19 patients are actually hospitalized. Uh, is, is, that, is that the case? And if it's true, how much of a problem is this to your efforts to predict uh, how, much more, uh, of a, how much more of a demand there will be on the healthcare system? 
Great. Uh, so Don's question is about hospitalizations, current hospitalizations. And, and Don, what I can tell you is that this has been a challenge across the country, trying to get a handle on the current number of hospitalizations. Uh, we work with hospitals in outbreak situations on a variety of fronts. And I'm quite proud of the way in which the state of Maine has worked very closely, hand in glove with hospital systems across the state. What we've encountered are challenges that other states have encountered as well, which is to say making sure that the data that we have around hospitalizations squares up with and is accurate in comparison to what the hospitals have. So for example, hospitals send us reports, but if those reports contain, for example, patients who are out of state residents, or patients who are awaiting confirmatory testing, or patients who are merely suspected of having COVID-19 but haven't received a diagnosis. We have to square that up against the diagnostic data that we've got. Doing so requires a team of epidemiologists, and our team of epidemiologists is, is working on just that. This is a problem, and this is a phenomenon that's occurred in other states. And we're working as well with the U.S. CDC to try to come up with a national way to get an accurate count of the current number of individuals who are hospitalized at any one time. What I will say is that on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't really affect our projections. What we generally look at are the total or cumulative number of folks who have been hospitalized. Although I, I, I agree that knowing the exact snapshot on any one day is also important. So I'm not diminishing the value of the data, but I wanna be straight with everybody about the challenges that we have in getting an accurate number, one that can be reported in a way that we have fidelity and, co and comfort that the answer, the number itself is 100% accurate. We're working really, really hard on that. Uh, quite literally, I think that's one of our epidemiology, our, our informatics team's top priorities right now is to get a better handle on that, as it is in other states. So once we've gotten our head around that and can report accurate data, we will absolutely be doing so. Um, I'd like to turn next to Kate Koff at the Ellsworth American. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, two questions. The first is, so there's a lot of shifting happening in the healthcare workforce right now. We've got people coming out of retirement and providers who would normally do preventative care, helping in hospitals and critical care units. Um, and in light of that, I'm wondering if the state uh, can or is doing anything to protect patients from surprise billing if they're seen by an out-of-network provider. Um, and then my second question, uh, I, you mentioned last week that there's a lot of misinformation circulating and I'm wondering if you might want to clear up a couple of the most common myths that you are hearing. Great. Um, thank you for that first question. For, so, Kate, as to the first question around surprise billing, um, I know that there have been discussions about that. Uh, I'm going to actually, uh, just to make sure I get you the most accurate information, I'm going to actually ask Robert Long, our communications director, to follow up with you and put you in touch with folks in the administration who will make sure that anything we give you is 100% accurate. Again, I know that there have been discussions, but I want to make sure anything I report is, is up to date. So Robert will be in touch with you to get you information. Um, but Kate, you asked about some common myths and myth, misconceptions. And, um, you know, in the same way that the outbreak changes really quickly, the most common myths and misconceptions change really quickly as well. The two most common that I have been asked by my friends and family members are one, whether I should be taking really high doses of certain vitamins in order to protect myself against COVID-19. And the answer there is that you should always be trying to get all your vitamins and minerals. If your doctor tells you you need to take a multivitamin, that's a good thing. But there isn't a particular vitamin or mineral that you need to have that will protect you exquisitely against COVID-19. The second most common myth or misconception is that I, my group, my age category, my health status makes me generally immune to COVID-19. I'm a healthy person in this age category and I don't need to worry about this. That's probably honestly the myth that I hear the most 
from my friends and family. And, and Kate, I, I just, I really want to be really straight with everybody. The virus itself does not discriminate against people in any different age group. And the data show that it has struck people across the age spectrum in Maine, across the country. And so even if you are a person who is young and healthy and has no pre-existing conditions, the virus can still strike you. And when it does, it can be very, very serious. And so that is probably the one thing that I would ask everyone to bear in mind, is that irrespective of your age, the virus can still strike. Um, I'd like to turn next to Steve Betts at the Courier Gazette. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I want to do a follow-up question to an earlier question. At what point, number-wise, for instance, if there's no new cases for a few weeks, at what point would you recommend re uh, loosening up on the restrictions that are in place now for uh, physical activity? Going out, going out in the public. Great. So Steve's question is, uh, what kind of signposts might we look at to try to get a sense of when we can start having discussions about lifting some of these restrictions? And, and Steve, it is partly about a lack of new cases or a size of, uh, uh, or a decrease in the number of new cases. That is part of it. Uh, there's not a single number that we've written on the whiteboard that will tell us when things can start going back to normal. Because there are other things we look at as well. We look at, for example, how the disease is continuing to spread. So, for example, in the same way that, oh, let me, let me say this differently, Steve. There's not a single outbreak of coronavirus going on in the United States right now. What there really are are multiple somewhat different outbreaks going on across the country. And we see that even within Maine. The outbreak in Cumberland and York County, where community transmission has been detected, is different from the few cases that we've seen, say, in Penobscot County, where there has not been community transmission. So the complexion of the outbreak is different in different parts of the state. Which, Steve, to your question, means that the way in which we loosen restrictions may differ in different parts of the state as well. We also take, in mind, take into account not just the number of cases, but who's in those counties. So if a particular county has a higher than average population relative to other places, or a higher than average number of long-term care facilities and nursing homes, we take those things into account as well. So, Steve, to be, to be straight with you, there's not a math equation on our whiteboard that will tell us when it's okay to get back to the way things were before. It will be a gradual process, and we take a number of different variables and factors into account as we're thinking about those things. We're also, of course, working with the U.S. CDC as they're putting out and thinking about guidance on this return to normalcy as well. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Brad Rogers at WGME. Uh, hi, Dr. Shaw. I have a couple of quick, quick questions, and forgive me. Uh, I want to know, do you have everything you need for these alternative care sites, or will you have to order some things, and what might that be, and how long it could take? Uh, but I also am hoping to get you to comment a little bit about uh, the states, mostly in the South, that aren't taking this thing seriously enough like we are in Maine. Sure thing, Brad. Uh, so Brad's first question is about the alternative care sites and what other additional supplies are needed. Uh, Brad, I, I would, again, you know, we, we've discussed a bit today and Commissioner Lambrew yesterday discussed the staffing piece. Staffing is a, is, a, is a key because this is a joint effort, not just the state, but the state with health care partners. Uh, the other things that are needed in order to get an alternative care site running and keep it running are all of the various supplies, both durable medical equipment as well as consumable medical equipment. The chief among those is PPE. What governs how much PPE we might need is what type of patients we determine working with our healthcare partners are best suited for the alternative care site. If it is determined that COVID-19 patients 
are the best use of the alternative care sites. In, for example, the same way that the President of the United States recently changed the mission of one of the naval, naval ships, then that requires a significantly higher volume of PPE than if it is for non-COVID-19 patients. So we've got scenarios that plan for both. Uh, as part of the alternative care site modules, there are manuals that specify the anticipated amount and volume of supplies. That, and so that's what we're using for our planning. But PPE and staffing are the two that I would point to. Brad, you also asked about certain states across the country that have not taken steps that are nearly as aggressive as those we've taken in Maine. And I certainly understand that each state views their situation differently. So I can't comment on what other states have or have not done. What I will say, though, is that the approach that we have taken in Maine is, first of all and most foremost, grounded in a sense of our shared humanity. We, our view is that we need to put the health and safety of people in Maine first. But we do so, and we do so, not in an abstract system, but taking into account science, data, and continually revisiting the questions that we've asked to see what's changed. I can't comment on how other states have gone about their planning, but I know that we've been quick, we've been concise, and we've been aggressive. And that's because our approach is one that's motivated by our desire to take care of people and grounded in data and science. I'd like to turn next to Dan Newman from the Maine Beacon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, there has been some significant disparities around race, uh, race uh, shown in other states. Um, is race one of the demographics uh, being tracked by the Maine CDC? And is there anything to report yet? Uh, so, Dan, that's a great question. As you note, just in the past few days, there have been some quite disturbing data that have been published by some other cities about the stark racial differences in not just who gets diagnosed with COVID, but also sadly who passes away. Uh, the most stark that I saw were in the city of Chicago, where nearly 70% of the fatalities from COVID-19 were among African-Americans. Uh, we, of course, are tracking similar data here. We haven't yet seen those stark disparities in Maine, uh, but we are keeping track of that. We are noting those disparities that have emerged in New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, and elsewhere. And certainly if we start to see signs of them, that, that will be an alarm bell for us. We are not just waiting until we see those signs, though. And Dan, I want to be really clear on this. We're not just waiting for the data to evolve before we start taking action. Very, very early on, we started working with groups that we knew had individuals who were at higher risk for various all types of diseases to make sure that those constituencies had information about COVID-19 and knew how to access the healthcare system, even if they did not have adequate insurance. And we continue to have those conversations to make sure the least equipped in Maine are well equipped to handle COVID-19. So we're not just waiting for bad data to appear. We wanted to think ahead on this and make sure that folks are equipped. I'd like to turn next to Steve Missler from Maine Public. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I guess I just have a general question for you. Um, I guess, um, do you, what, what, what do you, as you prepare for, you know, worst case scenarios or, you know, what may be coming as in terms of a peak, what is, what are you most worried about or what's at the top of your list of priorities? Is it testing capacity? Is it PPE? Is it better coordination with the hospitals? I guess what's just, what's most pressing for you at this point? What might, might keep you up at night? Yep. Um, well, um, let's see, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so Steve's question is, is where, where, where are, what are the, the things that are on the horizon that are deeply concerning right now? And what are we, what are we focused on? And Steve, I will, I, I would, I would shine a light on a couple of things. Uh, the first is the continued availability of PPE. Uh, as, as, as everyone is aware, we have received, according to the Strategic National Stockpile, we have received what Maine will receive for the time being, uh, which means now we have to turn both to other sources 
of PPE, as well as to look to manufacturing PPE within the state. PPE is vital, even in a world where high numbers of, especially in a world where increasing numbers of people are being infected, we need to have PPE to keep our frontline healthcare workers safe. So Steve, that's a concern. Uh, another concern that is high on our list is making sure that individuals who are not well can access health care expediently. Uh, this kind of goes back to Dan's question a moment ago about health equity. Health equity uh, informs much of our approach, if not all of our approach. And what I'd hate for us to do is to lose sight of the least well-equipped in Maine and, and have COVID-19 fall disproportionately hard on their shoulders. So one of the things that we're trying to do now is work with those groups, work with, say, federally qualified health centers to make sure they've got everything because groups like that are often the first and sometimes the only point of access into the healthcare system for individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. So those are two things that we're working on at our, with our team right now to try to get ahead of before we see any peak whatsoever. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Megan at WMTW. Dr. Shaw, my question is sort of piggybacking off of one of your last answers. Um, being that PPE is so vital to all the healthcare workers on the front lines, we've heard from uh, some viewers wondering uh, if they, you know, first responders and such, if they will ever, or I mean, I understand there's a slippery slope and it gets problematic, but will we know, uh, you know, the concentrations of who has COVID-19 in certain counties or where it is the highest so that if they respond to a call, they might be able to save PPE if they don't think it is a COVID-19 patient or sure it's not a COVID-19 patient. Sure, Megan, that's a, that's a good question. I'm glad that you raise it um, because first of all, we one of our primary aims from the very beginning of our work was to make sure that our first responders who are out there in the field putting their lives on the line every single day, that they were are as well equipped as they can be, not just with information, but with PPE. And so in recognition of the possibility that a first responder might be going into a household, uh, one of the things that we've had in place for quite some time now across the state are a series of questions that emergency medical dispatchers ask when someone calls and requests emergency medical assistance, the dispatchers ask whether anyone in the household that they are being that they're about to dispatch someone to has been tested positive for COVID-19, has been suspected of having COVID-19, or even has a cough or a shortness of breath, any kind of symptoms that would even be suggestive of COVID-19. And we ask that not just of the person who's in distress but everybody in the household. That way, first responders know when they're going into a situation, what the potential risk of coming into a COVID-19, coming in touch with the COVID-19 patient is. We put that in place really early on, first and foremost, because we want first responders to have all of the information they need in order to be able to provide good medical care, but also to recognize that PPE is a challenge. And when the answers to those questions are no, there are no COVID-19 patients, there, has no, there is no one with flu-like symptoms. The first responders can then make smart decisions about whether and when to use PPE. It's also, again, important to note that community transmission has and is occurring in at least two counties in Maine, York and Cumberland. And we fully expect community transmission to be detected across other counties as well. So we again recognize that first responders are taking a risk, especially in areas with community transmission, in the same way we all do anytime we come into contact with anybody. Um, I'd like to turn next to Caitlin Andrews at the BDN. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, I have two kind of quick questions. One is on the um, Abbott rapid response tests. Um, you know, have they arrived and how many um, capitals have you received um, and have those machines been distributed yet? 
And um, then I have another question about the temporary care units, but if you could address my first one. Sure, go ahead. Or I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead on that one. So um, the state of Maine uh, was able to secure 15 of the Abbott test machines. We initially thought that we would be receiving, uh, and these are just the machines that run the test itself, uh, kind of like the microwave that does the cooking. But what's equally important in these situations is the test kit, the chemicals where the patient sample is placed and put into the microwave. Initially, we thought we were going to be receiving a higher number. Unfortunately, the allocation that we received was much smaller than that. Um, and so that is a problem. And, and those machines, I should say, have just arrived in the past one hour and 15 minutes. Um, and so the fact that we got much, much less than we initially thought and were told we would be getting has, uh, we're going back to the drawing board today to get a better sense of what the best strategy for those machines will be. Again, our overall strategy is to utilize these rapid tests to effectuate two goals. The first is PPE conservation, because a patient who tests negative very quickly does not require healthcare providers to don as much PPE. The second strategy is to allow us to focus on populations who may be at a high risk to being lost to follow up. People experiencing homelessness, for example. Those are our operational goals. Now that we are taking a look at the machines, we're going to figure out the best way to deploy them. And again, I'll have more information on that very soon. Caitlin, you had a second question? Yes, um, about the um, alternative care site. So the state has said that it has 184 beds available throughout the state that it would hope to convert before possibly using these sites. But those are um, at various different hospitals around the state. Um, do you anticipate that you might need either the northern or the southern site first, potentially? And when do you think that might be? Um, and what do you see as the future of needing sites like these in the east and western parts of the state? Great. So Caitlin's question is about the geographical placement of these sites, as well as the order in which we may activate them. Caitlin, I, I again want to start by emphasizing that this this operation is being done in very, very close partnership and collaboration with our colleagues at the at, at, here at MEMA, as well as our colleagues at the National Guard, our colleagues at, at the federal level, and most importantly, our colleagues and our trusted partners in the main healthcare system overall, hospitals especially. So this is a joint effort. We are beginning our process first in the Portland area given the higher number of cases that we've seen there. The second stop will be the Bangor location. We're currently now in the planning phase and the evaluation phase for the potential need for sites in the western part of the state and the eastern part of the state. No final decisions have been made as to those latter two, and we're continuing to, co to, to work with our colleagues in the hospital systems to try to get a sense of A, the need, and B, the location. And as always, once we've got more information, we'll make sure we, we share it. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Paul Dwyer at WABI. Hey, good morning, Dr. Shaw. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, can we get an updated uh, number on the uh, healthcare workers that have COVID-19 and um, just anything that you've heard from them about how safe they're feeling um, and how, how they've been able to do their work? Uh, Paul, I don't have that in my notes with me right this moment. We'll be able to get that for you very soon. Um, but with respect to healthcare workers here in Maine, um, I've talked with quite a few of them. And I recognize fully the challenge that they are facing. Uh, they are truly the ones in the arena. Every single healthcare worker across the state, at every level of the healthcare system, they're the ones who are in the arena. And I can't express how much gratitude I have for them, recognizing the risk that they are taking, showing up at work, taking care of Maine people in challenging situations. Um, I really do commend them. I know that they are under a tremendous amount of stress, and it, it warms me to know that they 
feel that their role is essential, and I do thank them for that. I've had the privilege of chatting with quite a few Maine healthcare workers across the healthcare spectrum. We are hoping to do everything we can to continue supporting them as well. Uh, not just from a PPE perspective, but also from a mental health and behavioral health perspective as well. Um, I'd like to turn next to Sarah Dedham from the Machias Valley News Observer. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Yesterday, uh, Governor Mills announced $10 million in financial support for Maine's hospitals. Is anything additional being planned to support our EMS providers? Uh, Sarah, so Sarah's question is about additional supports for the EMS system. As you note, uh, Governor Mills and Commissioner Lambrew yesterday announced $10 million in payments as a first step to continue our support and commitment to hospitals across Maine. We do expect additional federal support coming as well from various pieces of legislation uh, that have been work working their way through Congress. We remain committed to supporting hospitals in Maine. And, and again, we view this $10 million as a first step. We're also open in, in thinking about other ways we can support healthcare providers more generally, be that EMS, workers, physicians, and all others who are on the front lines of the COVID-19 situation. No final decisions have been made about ways in which we may do that, but once we've got more to report, I certainly will, Sarah. And the last question for today goes to Kit Harrison from Mjumbo, Africa. Go ahead, Kit. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, I know you're deeply concerned with equity, and I just wanted to first to express my appreciation. Um, so you just mentioned that you don't have updated notes on numbers of healthcare workers who are sick with the virus with you today. But I just wondered, could you break down who you mean by healthcare workers other than doctors, nurses, respiratory specialists, etc.? Yep. Are you able to get information about numbers of cases among other people like custodians, housekeeping, food service workers, etc.? So uh, Kit's question is a great one which is, what do we mean by healthcare worker? And in this situation, Kit, we define healthcare worker extremely broadly. And it really encompasses anyone who could potentially come into contact with the patient. Uh, so we want, and the reason for that is partly because we recognize the value that every single environmental service worker at a hospital has, or every person at a kitchen at a hospital has, because the work that they're doing is just as vital as the work anyone else is doing. And so we believe they deserve the respect of being included in our definition of healthcare worker. It's also a matter of public health. Uh, part of the reason we track and are especially solicitous and concerned about healthcare workers is because they may come into contact with patients and thus transmit the disease or acquire the disease. It's both. So for that reason, we cast a very broad net for when we talk about healthcare workers and we define it to include anyone who may come into contact with the patient and thus be at risk for acquiring COVID-19 or transmitting COVID-19. Uh, before, we, before we wrap up today, uh, I'd like to just return to a theme I mentioned earlier, which is that every single person in Maine has been affected in some way by COVID-19. And I think it's important that we acknowledge the way in which all of our lives to varying degrees have been upended. No one really offers any special thanks for when you and your family stop doing things. Whether that's canceling a birthday party, changing the way you observe religious traditions, or fundamentally altering the way you interact with other people. This past weekend, uh, I was privileged to have a call with some faith leaders who were talking about the ways and asking for guidance on ways in which they could amend funeral practices and burial rites in order to respect traditions, but also keep people safe. And what struck me about that conversation was A, the fact that we are in a world where we have to have serious discussions about how to keep people safe at funerals, but also how willing those faith leaders were to work with public health 
to try to keep everyone in their communities safe. And what I didn't do on that call was thank them. Thank everybody for your willingness to abide by these recommendations. Never would I have thought by canceling a birthday party or by not going to prom or by changing the way a burial rite happens, we could actually save lives. But that is precisely what we are all doing together. And so on behalf of everyone in the state of Maine, I'd like to thank everyone who's watching for thanking you for taking these steps to keep us safe. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll talk tomorrow.